This time on Landmarks, we marvel at the beauty of Japan's highest peak. We party in France's most famous boulevard. Witness the rebirth of one of London's cultural icons. And visit two of the new seven wonders of the world. But first, few landmarks are more confounding or more beautiful than Cambodia's Angkor Wat. Built in the first half of the 12th century, Angkor Wat is the principal temple of what was once a vast metropolis. It is located five kilometres north of the modern town of Siem Reap and a short distance southeast of the former capital, Bapuan. The temple is admired for the grandeur and harmony of its architecture, its intricate bas-reliefs and sculptures. The detail is nearly unbelievable making the complex an architectural and scientific marvel. Unlike many monumental constructions, it's believed the Angkor Wat temple was conceived and completed within the reign of its founder, King Suyayaman II, in the first half of the 1100s. Dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu, it was built as the king's state temple and capital city. By the 12th century, Khmer architects were skilled and confident in the use of sandstone, most of the visible areas are constructed of sandstone blocks, while laterite was used for the outer wall and for hidden structural parts. More than 100 stone temples have survived, but time and a voracious jungle have long since claimed the many wooden structures. Angkor Wat combines two basic plans of Khmer temple architecture, the temple mountain and the later gallery temples. It is designed to represent Mount Meru, home of the gods in Hindu mythology. Within a moat and an outer wall 3.5 kilometres long, there are three rectangular galleries, each raised above the next. Many believe the temple's location was chosen as a settlement site because of its strategic, military and agricultural potential. But there are other, more cosmic theories. Unlike most Khmer temples which face east, Angkor Wat faces towards the west, some believe its purpose was to harmonise the earth with the stars by mirroring the heavens. It is claimed that its temple arrangements are based on an archaic planet-wide sacred geography. In 1177, Angkor was plundered by the Chams, the traditional enemies of the Khmer. Sacked by the Thais in 1431 and abandoned in 1432, Angkor was lost in time for a few centuries. One of the first Western visitors to the temple was Antonio da Magdalena, a Portuguese monk who visited in 1586, who said that it is of such extraordinary construction that it is not possible to describe it with a pen. In the 1970s, Cambodia suffered sustained damage during the Vietnam War and the subsequent civil war which saw the emergence of the brutal Khmer Rouge regime. Angkor Wat required considerable restoration in the 20th century, mainly the removal of accumulated earth and vegetation. Work was interrupted by Khmer Rouge control, but relatively little damage was done during this period. Since the 1990s, Angkor Wat has seen a resumption of conservation efforts and a massive increase in tourism. The temple is also part of the Angkor World Heritage Site, established in 1992. I think that uh, there will not be a lack of funds because uh, this belongs to humanity as a whole. I'm sure that there are uh, a lot of countries, agencies, and also the private sector that will be uh, willing to provide their contribution. Angkor Wat is now a major tourist destination. Attendance figures for the temple itself are not published, but in 2004, the country received just over one million international arrivals. What they see when they arrive is one of the world's great wonders of the past. Coming up, Japan's highest peak. There are few sights in the world more beautiful than a pristine mountain at dawn. 
The beauty of Mount Fuji, Japan's highest peak, stirs the heart of all who visit it. But to the Japanese, it is a national icon and symbol of the best their society has to offer. Mount Fuji, a dormant volcano, last erupted in 1708. Since then it has been docile and an inspiration to artists and nature lovers with its remarkable symmetrical shape. But it can also pose a frightening challenge. Its 3,776 metre peak has been host to many violent storms. Mountain climbers have for centuries taken the challenge. Then there are others less professional who also brave its peak. It's tough getting that first job. Just ask these young Japanese graduates who have been asked to literally climb a mountain for an interview. One of the country's apparel retailers wanted to make sure new employees have what it takes to scale the heights of business by interviewing them at the summit of Mount Fuji. 20 job seekers were asked to assemble at the peak of Japan's most famous landmark for a dawn interview. The company received 100 job applications for the four openings they advertised. However, only 50 people decided to apply when they found out the interview would be at the top of Japan's tallest mountain. But on the eve of the interview, only 20 actually turned up to start the climb and nine people dropped out halfway up the mountain. 11 people made it to the interview table with some needing oxygen on the way up. Making clothes must be a pretty tough business. We decided to interview these people in the hope that those who would take part in climbing Mount Fuji and would want to be interviewed in this gruelling environment would be interesting youths who have a passion for what they want to do. Those who made the climb got reasonably good weather. Often shrouded in cloud, Mount Fuji sometimes looks better from afar than on the mountain itself. July and August, when the mountain is usually free of snow, are the official climbing season months. The weather is relatively mild, access by public transport is easy and the mountain huts are open. If you're not an experienced hiker, as most of these young people weren't, the climbing season is the safest and most comfortable time to do so. Keisuke Niwa said he had been drawn to the company's originality. When I heard the interview was on top of Mount Fuji, I wondered what kind of company this was that would come up with such an idea. So I came here wanting to find out and see for myself what this company was about. And what made it come up with such an interesting idea. Keisuke got one of the four jobs, but not all had a good time. Actually, I have never climbed Mount Fuji before, so I actually came with the simple idea of wanting to climb the mountain, but I was not properly prepared. When we climbed the mountain for the sunrise this morning, I got drenched, and it was a pretty tough experience for me. For those students who didn't get the job, they came away with the satisfaction of having climbed Japan's greatest natural icon. The French are known to love a party, and Paris's most famous boulevard, the Champs-Élysées, is often the place where it all begins. This party was sparked by a win at the last Soccer World Cup. It wasn't a final, but the revellers were out in force, with many of them dressed in the French national colours of red, white and blue, and in their cars, of course. The 
Champs-Élysées were originally fields and market gardens until 1616. By the late 1700s, it had become a fashionable avenue. Queen Marie Antoinette visited with her friends and took music lessons at the Grand Hotel de Crillon on the Place Louis XV. Crowning the world-famous boulevard is the Arc de Triomphe de l'Etoile. Begun in 1806 on the orders of Napoleon in honour of the French army and finished 30 years later under the reign of Louis-Philippe, the Arc de Triomphe is France's great national symbol. In the middle of an imaginary line going from the Louvre to the Grande Arche de la Défense, it is today a link between the old Paris and the contemporary Paris. It has been the site of major events, like the return of the Emperor's Ashes in 1840 and the burial of the unknown soldier in 1921. But as this footage of Adolf Hitler shows, the ancient boulevard hasn't always been the site of celebration. It has been the place for military parades by the victorious and the vanquished armies since the early 1600s. The Champs-Élysées itself became city property in 1828 and the footpaths, fountains and gas lighting were added. Over the years, the avenue has undergone numerous transformations, most recently in 1994 when the sidewalks were widened. It is best known as the true heart of the city of romance. To mark the beginning of the Christmas festivities, film actress Monica Bellucci flicked a switch to light the avenue. Again, Parisians turned out in great numbers to see the lights and Bellucci, who was once crowned the world's most beautiful woman. For over a month before Christmas, Parisians and foreigners are able to walk arm in arm as they admire the sights and the lights. Some 135,000 bulbs and 45 kilometres of Christmas tree lights are used to illuminate the Champs-Élysées. Most shopkeepers, who are perhaps more practical than romantic, also enjoy the Christmas season. Their turnover increases around 60% at that time of year. Those with shops around the Champs-Élysées pay some of the highest rents in the world. Many businesses pay over $1 million a year in rental. No wonder they like the fairy lights. The lights are supposed to remind consumers to think about their Christmas shopping but most have their mind on other things in the city of romance. It's very beautiful, yeah. it's very, very beautiful. beautiful, yes. We like very much and uh, but what is happening with Monica Bellucci? It's, it's not normal. All the people here, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's great. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Christmas. Uh, Christmas time. Christmas time, yes. Yeah, it started uh, now, yes, it's very nice. We like very much. Paris is a city with a long history but its residents constantly remind us that it's important to live life in the present. And if you get the chance to get out there and party, join in the fun on the Champs-Élysées. Coming up, London's Royal Festival Hall. London the ancient capital of England, has been a regular source of stories for this series of landmarks. Even in Europe, few cities can boast as many recognisable or significant icons, such as Big Ben, Tower Bridge, the Tower of London, and the Thames River. Now, after two years of refurbishment, one of London's cultural and architectural icons, the Royal Festival Hall, has finally reopened. The arts complex on the south bank of the Thames was constructed as part of the celebrations for the Festival of Britain in 1951. In the half century since, the Royal Festival Hall had become one of the leading concert and cultural venues in the capital, but there had been criticisms of its acoustics and design. The work of the past two years has been to make good on those shortcomings. 
The main uh, changes here have been to the seating, where we have significantly increased the leg space to accommodate rather taller people than uh, was the case in 1951, so there's three inches more of leg room. The surfaces have been uh, taken down, stripped, cleaned, put back on, and we've now addressed some of the major acoustic problems. We've put some acoustic wings into the ceiling. The stage can now be raised up and down. And the combination of those two on the much harder surfaces has now uh, given us a much stronger acoustic. So all of the conductors who've been in here, all of the soloists who've been in here as we've been doing our acoustic trialing, have pronounced themselves very impressed with, uh, with what they've heard. The Russian conductor Vladimir Jurowski has returned to work with two orchestras based at the venue. Funding for the refurbishment has come from a combination of public and private contributions. The Arts Council and the Heritage Lottery Fund have contributed over £40 million, with a further £5 million from the government and another £7 million from the London Mayor's agencies. The whole project is going to cost just over £111 million and that includes all of the work that we've done outside the hall and also the building of the annex, the extension building, where all of the staff who were previously housed here have now been moved to. As a result of that move, 35% of additional public space has been created, which has opened the building up. It looks wonderfully light, wonderfully transparent. The opening was given the title of The Overture and attracted lively crowds throughout the weekend. Besides the music, there were wonderful displays echoing the nearby Thames River. The original 1951 Festival of Britain was significant and is still rather optimistically referred to as heralding a new Elizabethan age. It was a festival to mark the end of the war and the, uh, hopefully the growing prosperity after the war and indeed that prosperity has come around and this site is now absolutely thriving. Uh, we have about 14 million visitors a year to the site as a whole. Uh, we have uh, opened up some wonderful restaurants and wonderful shops. We have a great cultural programme. So this is now one of the key destinations for people from London, all over the United Kingdom, and an increasing number of people from all over the world come here to see great work. The refurbished hall takes advantage of its proximity to the River Thames. With easy accessibility, Patrons are increasingly using Festival Hall's other attractions, such as the restaurants and cafes. The substantial revenue they raise contributes to funding the Hall's music programme. But the main attraction is, of course, the music. All four of the Hall's resident orchestras were featured in the first of the gala night concerts. It was a night to remember. When the successful new Seven Wonders of the World candidates were announced in Lisbon on July 7, 2007, Machu Picchu in Peru was among the winners. 100 million people worldwide voted via the internet as the Inca city took its place alongside the Great Wall of China, the Taj Mahal, Petra in Jordan, the Colosseum in Italy, and the Christ the Redeemer statue in Brazil. In the 15th century, the Incan emperor, Pachacutec, built a city in the clouds on the mountain known as Machu Picchu, or Old Mountain. This extraordinary settlement sits at 8,000 feet above sea level, halfway up the Andes Plateau, deep in the Amazon jungle, and above the Urubamba River. Another successful Central American candidate for one of the new Seven Wonders of the World was Chichen Itza. Mexico's most famous ruins were once the most important Mayan capital in the region. The city flourished during the years 750 to 1200 AD as a political and religious centre, and its well-preserved remains include various temples, a pyramid, a church and a plaza. 
various structures have survived and demonstrate the extraordinary commitment to architectural space and composition. The pyramid itself was the last and arguably the greatest of all Mayan temples. The new problem is for these well-preserved sites to cope with their own popularity. We know that the number of visitors has grown year by year, and now we have to think about how we're going to manage the visitors. Maybe we can suggest routes so visits are not concentrated on the castle and see how we can diversify the entire site. This is something we are thinking about, and for that we have to fix a number of things in the site to prepare for large visits. The site's directors are proud that Chichen Itza outpolled the Eiffel Tower, Stonehenge and Angkor Wat, but worry about what its success might bring. Claudia Garcia Solis and other archaeologists have just finished a two-year restoration of Il Castillo, including work on the so-called Jaguar Chamber, which is yet to be open to the public. The chamber holds a statue of a red-coloured jaguar encrusted with jade stones. Solis says preservation and maintenance are fundamental in allowing experts to keep restoring the site. Tourists are enthusiastic. The ruins already see 1.2 million annual visitors. Chichen Itza is very beautiful. This is the third time I've been here. I'm Brazilian and this place, along with the Christ statue in Rio de Janeiro, really should be one of the wonders of the world. Archaeologists want to promote other Mayan sites in the Yucatan Peninsula, like the pyramids at Uxmal and Cova, as a way to disperse tourists while introducing them to other facets of the culture. We don't want to be reactive and work on something that's already deteriorated, but take measures of preservation that are already functioning. Maintenance is very important, and we need a constant maintenance budget, so there won't be problems with deterioration, allowing us to do research and work more with that. The ancient Greeks chose the original Seven Wonders of the World, but 2,000 years later, only the Great Pyramid of Giza remains. Hopefully these new wonders will carry on for future generations.